So this week we're going to kind of talk about two things simultaneously. We are going to be talking about lists and dictionaries, um, data structures, if you will. We are also going to be talking some about the project because the data structures is the last piece of the puzzle that you need to do the project appropriately. We're going to go through some example code. It's by no means any, everything that you need for your project, but it is an example of some of the more difficult concepts. So what's a data structure? Well, a data structure is a way to create a collection of information. That information can be anything. It can be your baseball cards. It can be, you know, my yarn stash. It can be a collection of anything. And Python allows us to create those collections or gives us the opportunity to create those collections in two ways. We have lists and we have dictionaries. A list has certain properties. It is ordered, it's mutable, and it has an index. And we've used lists before because we've talked about strings. And we've done a little bit where we've sorted some strings and created a list. We're going to do a deep dive into lists today. And there is a dictionary, which we haven't really talked much about. It is an unordered list. It is mutable, which means it can be changed. And here you're mapping keys to values. And it's a very different concept than what we have previously worked on as lists. This, there is no index in a dictionary. You are giving a name and then what that name means or what value is associated with that name. It's almost like creating all of these individual little variables and putting them into a collection. So we have some new symbols tonight. And the, the square brackets aren't actually a brand new symbol, but they are... Um, it's important to understand that they are associated with lists and in one way they are associated with dictionaries. The new, real new symbol here is the open and close squiggly brackets. And they denote a dictionary. So when you're creating a dictionary, you or you are using the squiggly brackets. When you're creating a list, you're using the open and close square brackets. So, ordered and mutable. Let's talk about lists first. And we're going to go back to one of my favorite subjects, CRUD. Create, read, update, and delete. And you can use CRUD with lists, just like you could with strings. You can create a list. You can read from the list or access data that is stored in the list. You can update or modify an existing element in the list, and you can delete an element in the list, or you can delete the whole list. So here's our little CRUD chart. So create. To create a list, I can create an empty list, which is nothing inside the square brackets, or I can create a list that is populated. Now, I think we've talked about it before, but I want to bring it up again. Um, lists can have any type of element in them. They don't, a, a list doesn't, it, it's not just a list of strings or a list of integers. You can have anything that you want inside of a list. Um, so you can create it in two ways, unpopulated or populated. An unpopulated list just tells Python that, you're going to use that variable like a list. I can read or I can get the data from the list. Because lists are indexed, just like strings are, then you get to it from its index value. So whenever I want to get at whatever is in my list, and I want to get to the first element, it's my list of zero. Because just as a quick refresher, all lists start with an index value of zero. I know it's confusing. It's the first element, so why doesn't it start with one? 
I can't answer that question. I can just tell you that the first element in any list, the index value of the first element in any list is going to be zero, period, and there's no way to change it. So I can also use a for loop with a list. When I talked about for loops, I said for loops are made for lists. We're going to see that tonight. For loops are made for lists. You can use the in command and just say for some variable name in the variable name of your list and just go through it and you never have to worry about walking off the end of your list. You never have to worry about an index out of bounds exception. Update. So I can change a value in place. So I can replace the value of a given element in the list, of a given index position in the list. So if, um, sorry, I can update the list. Yeah, let me back up. The first example under update is replacing an element in the list. I simply have the variable name of the list, the index value that I want to replace, that I want to set the value, and then on the right hand side of the single equal sign is the value. And that goes for a list that already has those number of elements in it. But if you want to add to the end of a list, you want to use a list function called append. Now, Python, I've got the little data structures. Um, URL down here, Python has massive amounts of these functions. And they're very useful and they're very handy. And I suggest that if you want to, you go out and look at what Python says about its data structures. Because there's also some good examples there. Okay, I can also remove the first element in the list by a function called pop. So those are just two examples of functions. I've used append quite often. I've never actually used pop, but I thought, well, I'm saying I ought, to, I ought to have both sides of the list. I ought to show you how to append to the bottom of the list and pop from the top of the list. So delete. I can delete an element in a list, or I can delete an entire list using the DEL keyword, which we have used previously. So DEL when I have the variable name, in this case, my list, and I give it an index, in this case, two, I'm going to delete the third element from the list. If I want to just get rid of the entire list, I can do a DEL my list. So those, that's CRUD for lists. Create, read, update, delete. And I know I'm going a little bit fast, and you can slow me down if you want. One of the reasons I'm doing this is because we are, we are going to go through an example of some of the functionality of the game, and I wanted to give us enough time to do that. Oh, any questions? Sorry. No. Okay. So let's go through some list basics. And this, if you want to follow along, it's challenge 6.1.1. And what I want to do is I want to modify a short name of list by deleting the first name, the first element, and changing the last element to Joe. So I'm Professor Lisa. I'm typing in Gertrude, Sam, Ann, and Joseph. It is a string with comma separate, with each value comma separated. So the way I create a list from that is I split it. Left-hand side is the name of the variable. The right-hand side is my whatever my user input variable was. In this case, it's user underscore input. And then I use the split function, and I tell it that I want to split by a comma. What Python gives me back is a populated list. And this is what you're going to have to do for labs this week. You're going to have to remember how to split and get a populated list back. So first thing I need to do is I need to delete the first element in the list. Well, I can, I could pop it. I could also say del names, open and close, zero, because the zero index is the first element in the list. 
And then what I would have is I would have a list, but now it only has three elements in it. It doesn't have four, like the four that I had entered. Now I want to take the last element in the list and I want to change it to Joe. So I'm a smart programmer. I know that I only have three elements in the list. That means my last element is at index two. And I just simply set names at index two equal Joe. And that changes the value of the list. Okay, we can talk about um, list methods for an entire hour. I promise I won't. Um, some notable ones, and these might be because you have to use them in labs this week. Count, which will count the number of items in a value, or sorry, in a list with a given value. So I have a string and I want to know how many times the letter A appears in that string. I would use the count function for that. Uh, sort. I can sort a list. Um, it will sort it in alphabetical order. Append. I can add an element to the end of the list. And reverse does a reverse sort order. And you will have to use both sort and reverse in one of your labs this week, as well as you'll have to use count in one of your labs this week. So, sort and reverse. This is challenge 6.2. I'm going to input some. This time I'm inputting a list of five names into my program. And I, they are not comma separated. They are separated by spaces. However, I can still use the split command because the split command with nothing in it will just split on a space. What I get back from Python is a list with five strings in it, Jan, Sam, Ann, Joe, and Todd. So now I want those in alphabetical order. So I could write a fancy loop that did that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to use what Python already does because I can't do it faster and better than the Python programmer did, and they've given it to me. So it makes a lot of sense for me to reuse what they've done, the community has tested, and that I don't have to write. So I'm just going to use the sort function. It uses the dot notation, which we've talked about previously. So it would be names, which is the variable that contains the list. Dot sort says use the sort function on the variable names that contain the list. And what it will give me is it will reorder my list. Now you'll notice that here that there's nothing on the left-hand side of names. There is no equal sign. There is no other variable. And that's because Python isn't making a copy. Python is simply changing that list around. So you don't have to set anything equal to the, to the result of sort because sort's just going to change names. It's just, you're just not going to need to say equal anything because sort just does it in that memory space associated with the list for names. And now I want to reverse. So I'm going to do the same thing. On the variable names, I'm going to use the dot notation so I can do a reverse sort of the values. And again, there's nothing on the left-hand side of names. I don't need to set it equal to anything because Python's just going to take what's in that memory space and it's going to reorder them for me. And that memory space will now have Todd, Sam, Joe, and Jan, and Ann as the reverse sort order. So that's all you have to do. It's actually, if you can remember that you have to use the dot notation and that you're using the sort and the reverse, against the variable that contains the list, that really is all you have to do. And it will get you the right answer. Okay. Four loops were made for lists. I think I've said it a lot, but they are. So if I, let's say 
I have an hourly temperature. And I'm a temperature nerd, I'm a weather geek, and I go out and I collect the temperature one afternoon. And I'm going to put that into my program and I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate the elements with a dash and a greater than sign and I'm going to surround each one by spaces. So I have to do this in a loop. Now, I said you don't actually have to do ranges, but sometimes it's important to do the range because you have to know what the last element is. Because what I don't want is I don't want 90 and then that arrow and 92 and then an arrow and 94 and the arrow and then 95 and an arrow. I don't want an arrow after 95. So what I have to do is I have to know that I'm on the last element. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to say for index, index is just a variable name that's valid only in the local scope of the for loop. In range, I have my range function, which we talked about with loops before. And the easiest thing for me to do is just use the len function, which is for length, and get the length of the list. I don't know how many elements are going to be in that list. I don't know if I'm going to be lazy in type 3 or if I'm going to be, you know, really, you know, I'm going to test this really well and type in 10. So because I don't know that when I'm programming, I want to make it as data-driven as possible. Using the len function with the list variable will make that more data-driven. So I just talked about in. So I'm going to print the hourly temp at whatever my index is, and then I'm going to use it as a Space. So it's going to be the temperature and a space. I don't want a new line. I have to have that end equal quote space quote or I won't get the space in between. I'll get a new line and that won't be right. Now here's where I'm checking to see if I'm at the last element. If the index that I'm at is not equal to the length of my list minus 1, I have to do the minus 1, because all list indexes start at zero. If I'm not, then I'm going to print my little, uh, yeah, my little arrow. So we're just going to run through this real quick. I just had 90, and I'm at index one, which is going to be 92 now, and I'm going to print the arrow. And then I'm at index three, sorry, index two, which is 94. And I'm going to print the arrow. And then I'm at index three, which is 95. And I'm not going to print the arrow because I know that three is the last index for this list because it is one minus the length of the list variable. So this is a case that you might come up against where you have to make sure that you know if you're on that last variable that last value in a list or not. So the in operator will evaluate each element in order. Now here's where things get a little more complex and that's because we're talking about multi-dimensional lists. Up until now, it's pretty much been review, except for the reverse and sort and count. So what's a multidimensional list? A multidimensional list is a matrix. If you've ever seen a spreadsheet, that's a matrix. And the matrix is rows and columns. That's what you have. And we can process things by rows and columns using a multi-dimensional list and just because I'm going to repeat this a lot for every dimension in the matrix you have to have a, a nested for loop you have to have a for loop that's independent well not independent but you have to have a for loop so we know so far that lists have been flat so I can take this spreadsheet or this matrix 
or multidimensional list and turn it, I can turn this into a multidimensional list. Well, how do I do that? Well, to, to create any list, I have open and close square brackets. So I'm going to have a variable called my multi list. I'm going to set that equal to open and close square brackets. That's fine. That's not a multidimensional list, that's an empty list. But these are the outer square brackets. And then for each row, I am going to create a list inside the list. So inside the outer bracket, I'm going to create a list of 10, 20, and 30. And I'm going to enclose that in brackets. So I have a list inside my list. Then I'm going to have a comma, and then I'm going to do it because uh, all list elements are comma separated, whether they're an object, whether they're a list, whether they're, uh, you know, it doesn't matter the type. You, you have to separate your list elements by commas. Then I'm going to do 40, 50, and 60. So I'm going to add another list, open and close square brackets, 40, 50, and 60. Those are all separated by commas. And then I'm going to add another comma after the closing bracket for the 40, 50, 60 row. And now I'm going to add 70, 80, and 90. And I'm done. Now notice after 70, 80, and 90, there's no comma. That's because I'm not adding another element. I'm ending the list. So I have open and close square brackets on the very outside. That is the outer square brackets of that list. And then inside of it, I have created three individual lists, and those three individual lists have their own square brackets. They're lists in and of themselves. They just happen to be inside of another list. So that is how you take a spreadsheet and represent it as a multidimensional list. And remember the concept of rows and columns, because that's how you're going to process this when you use nested for loops, which we're going to do in just a minute. So nested loops, we're going to print, a two, print the two-dimensional list, multiply, multi-table by row and column. So here's where you have to use nested loops. So I'm going to input some values. I'm going to input 1, 2, 3, comma, 2, 4, 6, comma, 3, 6, 9. And even though it doesn't look like it, there are spaces in between those. And 1, 2, 3 has a comma, has a comma after it. 2, 4, 6 has a comma after it. So I know that I'm going to have, well, let's look at the next line. The next line says I'm going to split it by commas. So now I have three strings because, remember, input is always a string. So now how do I go from three strings to a multidimensional list called table? Well, the first thing I do is I create an empty variable called table, and I set it, well, I have create a variable called table, and I set it equal to an empty list. Then I say, okay, I know that each one of those strings in quotes in my list rows is actually numbers, and they're separated by spaces. So what I can do is I can go through the rows and then split each of those strings and then I'm going to be able to put those into a, a new list and then put them back into table. So what I have here is I have at first I have a for loop and I'm calling this row counter on purpose. Because remember back when we just, the last slide, we were looking at a rows and columns like a spreadsheet. So I'm going all multidimensional lists or most multidimensional lists you will process are row wise, which means you always start with the row and then you get to the individual cell. So I'm just creating a variable. I have four. I'm creating a variable called row counter. I'm saying in range len rows, so however many of those strings that I have with numbers in them. And then I'm going to now create another list. This list is called cells, and it's rows 
of row counter dot split. So I know my row is got numbers separated by spaces. And so I'm going to split that to create a list of, in this case, strings. I forgot the quotes and I apologize, but one, two, three. So I'm going to create now another empty list called row. And after row, I am going to go through each of the elements in that cells list that I created and add them to my new um, table row. And then once I've done that and I've gotten all the ones done for cell, then I add row to my table. I append it. And I do the same thing for the next row and the next row until I'm done and I have a table with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 2, 4, 6, and 3, 6, 9. And I'm sorry I'm a little out of step with this. And then I'm going to output it. So now I can just say for row in table. I don't need to worry about the counter. And then for index, cell in enumerate row. So here's something new. Enumerate is a handy dandy function that Python gives you that says give me back the index as well as the value. I want them both because I, I need them both to do something. And in this case you need them to make sure that that line that you're printing between the numbers doesn't get printed after the end of a row. And this is this is in lieu of what we could we did in the other one the other one we kept track of the length here we can just say enumerate it will do the same thing you just have to make sure that you have a variable for both the index and the value and the way you do that the syntax for that is index comma cell index is a variable name cell is a variable name you put a comma between the two just like if it were a multi-return, use the in keyword and then you use the enumerate function. And the argument for the enumerate function is the multi-dimensional, or is the, the table that you are working on, sorry, the list that you are working on at the time. And because we are already inside a for loop for, with a row, we can just give it row. And then I say if index is not equal len of row minus one, because that's why we needed the index, then I'm going to print the cell a pipe and I'm going to print end equal just empty, just empty quotes because I don't want a new line. And then I'm going to say otherwise, I'm just going to put the cell, sorry. Otherwise, I'm just going to put the cell. Okay, so before we go to dictionaries, I think I have one. Uh, what's that one? Yeah. Um, so this is, I'm looking at the time. We have dictionaries to go. I will come back and run through that one in the code unless everybody wants me to do it now since we're going to go into dictionaries next. And I'm looking at the time. So, okay. If you want me to go over that, just put it in the chat and I'll check, check back to the chat in a, just a minute. Dictionaries. Dictionaries are a brand new container. We haven't talked about dictionaries yet. You have to understand dictionaries properly to do your game. Dictionaries are what they call an associative container. They associate keys and values. And anything can be a key, and anything can be a value, including another dictionary. They are an unordered collection. There is no index. It doesn't care what was entered first or what was entered last. It is simply an unordered collection. And it's not a list. It, it is, there is no index. It is 
um, a different concept of a collection. And if you've ever worked or have you ever done an SQL class or database class, you will have learned about SQL. Well, there's a whole, a whole, um, a whole series of databases that are called no SQL databases, and they're all based on dictionary concepts. So, how do I know it's a dictionary as opposed to a list? Because it was defined with the curly brackets, um, and it has members which are keys and values. So here, what we see is. I have a variable called my dict. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of that single equal sign, I have an open squiggly left squiggly brace. And then I have these things separated by colons and commas. So a name value pair has some value on the left-hand side, a colon, and a value on the right-hand side. You can almost look at that like an equal sign because name in the scope of the dictionary is kind of like a variable and it contains the value Lisa. Age is kind of like a variable in the scope of the dictionary and it contains the value 42 and amount is kind of like a variable and it contains the value 3.14. So that's what a dictionary is. Oh, and then you end it with a squiggly brace. And each name value pair has to be separated by a comma. And that's what makes up a dictionary. And you can have one element in a dictionary. You can have no elements in a dictionary. You can have massive amounts of elements in a dictionary. It is not in any way type specific. And pretty much anything can be a name and anything can be a value. Um, so let's just go over this. Key value. Name is the key. The associated value is Lisa. Age is the key. The associated value is 42. Amount is the key. The associated value is 3.14. So that is how you look at it. When you look at a dictionary, you have almost like a little matrix, a key and a value key and a value, key and a value, and the colon separating always separates the key from the value. Okay, let's just do our little crud chart for dictionaries. I can create a dictionary. Create an empty dictionary. Create a populated dictionary. I can read from a dictionary. I can now Here's something different, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in a minute. You'll notice when I'm saying I'm accessing data in the dictionary, I'm not using squiggly braces after my variable name. I have print, I have the variable name my dict, and then I have a square bracket, the string name, a square bracket. And that's because the way you access data in a dictionary is by the key and um, you use the square brackets to do it. I know it's a little confusing you, that you don't use squiggly brackets. You only use squiggly brackets when you're defining your dictionary. When you get at information or you access the data in the dictionary, you're going to use the square brackets. Oh, and by the way, dictionary keys have to be unique. So I can update it. I can change the value. I can change the name in from Lisa to Fred simply by having on the left-hand side of a single equal sign the variable that contains the dictionary, open bracket, the key that I want to associate with something different, close bracket, and then on the right-hand side of the single equal sign, I could say Fred or Millie or Chair or whatever. And I can add a new element to the end of a dictionary by using the append function. This append function is a little different than the one for a list. I'm still using the variable for my dictionary. I am using the dot operator to call the append function, and that's saying, 
hey Python, append whatever I'm telling you to append to the variable my dict. So w inside the parentheses for the append function is the new key, whatever that key is. And then to the right hand side of the equal sign is whatever the new value is. So that's important to remember when you're using that append function. The argument for the append function is the key, and what's on the right hand side of a single equal sign is the value. I can delete. I can delete the entire dictionary. I can delete the entire dictionary. So I have this associative thing. How do I iterate over it? And this is something you're going to have to know for your game. Okay, so I'm going to write a loop that prints each country's population in country pop. Seems very simple, but this is actually more complex because I'm entering the stuff as a dictionary. So what you'll see kind of underneath the definition of the problem is C colon 136 comma I colon 124 comma US colon 318 comma 0252. So I want to turn those into a dictionary and then use that dictionary for stuff. So the first thing I'm going to have to do is some intermediate work. So I'm going to first take that input and I'm going to split. So what it's going to give me is it's going to give me four strings. Each of those strings has, in this case, a uh, value, a colon, and a number. And I want to turn that into a working dictionary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an empty dictionary so I have a place to put things. And I'm now going to say four pair in entries. Entries is my list, so basically this is a for loop over a list. And I'm going to say split underscore pair equal pair dot split colon. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking each element that in that list and I'm splitting it on a colon. So I should now have a list of two elements. In this case, C and 136. So then I'm going to say I want to now add this to my dictionary. I've already created the empty country pop dictionary outside of the local scope of the for loop so that I can, in fact, um, keep it around for later. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say country underscore pop, and then I'm going to take the first element of my new list split pair, and that's going to be my key, and then the second element of split pair is going to be my value. So the first entry in that dictionary is going to be C136, and then I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop, but it's going to go to the next, uh, the next entry in my entries list, and that's going to be I. I'm going to create an I and a 124. That's going to now be added, so my country pop is going to grow by one. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. I'm now going to do US and 318. I'm now going to then create a country pop of three elements, three name value pairs. And then I'm going to do O and 252. And I have now a dictionary of four different key value pairs. C136, I2124, US318, and O252. And by the way, I don't know that you'll have to do it this week, but I think in the files, one, you're going to have to do something like this when you get to week seven. But So that's done. So now... Um, I want to print each country's population, um, write a loop that prints each country's population in country pop. So now I have to write another list. This is not a nested list. This is just another, sorry, it's not a nested loop. It's just another loop. So here I'm introducing a function called items. 
Now, items is very handy because what it does is it works on a dictionary and it gives me back both the value, the name, and the value because it's name value pairs or it gives us, sorry, the key and the value. So I have a for loop. I have a variable called country pop. I have a comma and a variable called pop. That's because items is basically a multi-return and it's going to give me both the country and the population. In country pop died items, so that basically says Python, get me whatever the next set of items are for um, the next key value pair for the country pop dictionary. So country, I was going to say print country has pop people. And so that's what it's going to do. Oh, sorry. I didn't, I didn't really give you. So that's what it's going to do. It was going to print basically, and I didn't do the printout for that one, but that's what it would do. Okay. So. Okay. Dictionary values can be anything including another dictionary. This is a very specific format for a dictionary because you're going to have to do something very close to this for your project. So I have a dictionary called rooms. And for my house or my game, I have three rooms, room one, room two, and room three. Now, Room one, I can get to two different rooms from room one. I can get to room two, and I can get to room three. I can get to room two by going south, and I can get to room three by going north. Room two, I can only get to room one, and room three, I can only get to room one. Mine's very simple. So what does this tell me? What am I looking at? I'm looking at a dictionary called rooms. My first key in rooms is room one. The, the value associated with room one is another dictionary. And that dictionary contains the rooms that I can get to from room one and the direction. So I always have the direction as the key and the room as the value. So from room one, if I go south, I go to room two. From room one, if I go north, I go to room three. My next element in my rooms dictionary is room two. That is my key. And then the value for the key room two is another dictionary. That dictionary is, if I go north, I go to room one. I have a third Val key for rooms, that's room three, and it I have as its value another dictionary. If I go south, I go to room one. Now, the directions are specifically the keys on purpose, and you'll find that out in the next slide. All right, so this is how to use the concept of move between rooms with a dictionary. Same dictionary as on the other page. First of all, you have to have a place to start. And if you're doing your program, your your um, your sorry, your game, you'll have your place to start, and it will be outside your game while loop. Because, and that's whatever you start at, whatever, whether it's the main entry hall, whether it's the dungeon, whatever, wherever you're going to start, that's where you need to start. So you have to give it a starting place. And then the user, Professor Lisa, for my class, my, my class is going to enter a direction. Now, there's some checking that you have to do here about the validity of the direction. We're not going to get into that. What we are going to get into is the concept of how I use that dictionary to get to another room. And it's very simple. First of all, I'm going to check whether the current room that I'm in, oops, sorry, that's, that's wrong, current underscore room. Okay, let's do that again. 
the first thing I need to do is I need to d know that if a direction that I that I typed in is valid, maybe I typed in A B C D E, um, maybe I typed in one two three four. We don't know. Maybe I typed in south. Maybe I typed in west. Who knows? But I have to check to see if that direction is valid. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to check it. I'm going to check it with an if statement, and I'm going to say if direction not in current room dot keys. Keys is a new function, and what that does is it gives me a list of the keys. And since I have a list of the keys, it's just a list. I can treat it just like a list. I can use the in keyword and in this case in conjunction with the not keyword to say is it an invalid entry. So if I've typed in A, B, C, D, E as my direction, what's going to print out to the screen is invalid entry. Otherwise, I am now going to set the new current room to the current room of direction. So if my current room is 1 and I've typed in south, my new current room will be room 2. I have just moved rooms. That is how you programmatically move rooms. Okay, now this is a very short example and you're going to have to apply this to the larger concept of your program. But in a few minutes we're going to sit down and we're actually going to go through um, a, a larger example with these rooms. Again, just a couple of rooms but an idea of where you could start. Okay, and of course we have you doing labs this week as well. So, lab 6.12 is um, basically, oh, we're going to use average and sum. So, um, we're going to input some strings. We're going to convert. We're going to split it based on spaces. We're going to convert strings to integers. Um, we're going to set it equal to an empty list. And for each token in the list, we're going to basically convert it to an integer and append it to our token. Token, sorry, append token to input data. So input data is just an empty list, and we are creating a list of integers from the string. Then once we're done with that, we want to get the average, and we want to get uh, the average value and the max value. So what we can do is there might just be a sum function that Python provides that you can give it a list, and it's just going to give you the sum of all the data in the list. And then, of course, an average is dividing by the length. So that would be using the len function against the input data. So now we have a max value, and um, there might just be a max function that Python gives you if you go out and look on the internet, and you can simply do the max of the list, of the input data list. So I would go out and check online for a, a list of integers that uses a max function for Python and one that uses a sum. Okay, filter and sort a list. So again, I'm going to input some information. I'm going to split that information into tokens. I'm going to create an empty list, call it input data. I'm going to add whatever my token is, whatever my element is in the list, to my input data list as long as it's not zero. I've got to get rid of all the zeros. So then I'm going to sort um, the input data. And then I'm going to go through the sorted list and I'm going to output the values. So we have to make sure that when we output the values, we're outputting with a space at the end so it's going to be value, space, value, space, value. But we don't want to space after the last value. So you need to go back and look at some of those examples that we did. Okay. 
Word frequencies. This is where you use the count function. So we're going to input a value, and um, we're going to split the value. And then I think you're inputting a character and a sentence. And then you're going to say for user, index in user sentence, and you're going to output the, the uh, user sentence index and the count of user sent sentence index. It's actually just a couple of lines of code. I didn't explain it well, sorry. Okay, word replacement. <laughs> Yes, we are asking you to do a lot. So I've got word pairs. And it's going to be an empty dictionary. This is a dictionary one. And I'm going to input. I'm going to call it the variable user input. And I'm going to input some word pairs. And then I'm going to split what I've input. And then I'm going to say for index and range from zero to length tokens, increment by two. Because what I've done is I've got a bunch of different words and I have typed them in. So when I split them, I just get a list of words. But I want the value at index 0 to be a key and the value at index 1 to be a value. And then I want the value at index 2 to be a key and I want the value of index 3 to be a value and so forth. So... I'm going to go through that list and I'm going to say set word pairs of token at index equal token of index plus one. So basically I have zero and I'm, I'm adding the, I'm adding to the dictionary. So I'm appending to the dictionary the name, the, the key and the value and then the key and the value. And then they want to grab a user sentence from input and then I'm going to replace some words. So when they give me a certain key, I'm going to replace it with the value. That's basically what you're doing. Okay, that was a lot. I know it was a lot. Um, and so now what we're going to do is, where is it? Is that it? Okay, we're going to go over this. Now, this is not your... Uh, hold on. Yeah. This is kind of a template for your program. It is not your program. You will have to change things in this. This gives you the idea of your control loop, of a current room, of how I've got an in-room function that you can use to change between rooms, and I've got some instructions. So this can be used as a template. Now, in this template, my directions are up, down, right, and left, and I only have three rooms. So let's run through this for just a minute and look for some pitfalls. First of all, my rooms dictionary has to be defined up at the top, and my functions have to be defined. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, I'm going to define my entry value and my sentinel value because this has to be a while loop. And this is directions. Okay. And so I'm going to put this through my handy-dandy debugger, and I know this is a lot. I know we've done a lot tonight. So I'm going to start at room one. So for your game, you're going to start wherever you're going to start. Stop is equal to go. The variable stop is equal to go. Whoops. All right. So I know that when I hit this while loop, go is not equal to Q, and I'll keep going. So here's my frames and variables. I don't have anything yet because I've just stopped. Oops, variables. I have, sorry, table, index. Okay. So let's step over. Why is it saying table, index, row? 
I don't know. I don't know why my pie charm is being weird. So I'm going to step over again because I'm now in my loop. So the first thing I'm going to do in my loop is I'm going to ask the user where do you want to go. Now I can wait for user inputs. So let me be... Uh, oh, sorry, I have a none there. I do have a, uh, uh, an issue. I'm going to type in A, B, C, D, E because I will do this if you are my student. It's not quit. It's not in directions. I am. It's not a valid input. I'm going to continue. That's a check you have to do. So now it's going to do it again, and I'm going to do, where can I go from my room? I'm going to go up. Up. Up is not Q. Um, user input is in directions. Here I have if current room is room one. And now, yes. It's not, uh, I have to go back and look at it, Lewis. You're, um, so um, this is a place for you to start. This is not a place for you to end. So I will go out and look to see if I can figure out where the nun is coming from. I did it last year and I must not have saved the, um, the corrected one. But I'll see what I can do before I upload it. Yes, Joey. Um, part of the rubric is going to talk about the articulation of your response and what often teachers are going to measure is how well, um, how well you understand what you're doing. So you don't have to write volumes, but it would be a good idea to have comments along the way to say, you know, I'm entering my loop. You know, this is my function for that kind of stuff. So my current room, what is my current room? Well, I'm in room one, so I'm here. And I'm going to, to now call my in-room function, which I'm going to step into. And my in-room function has a room and a direction. And I want to know where I'm supposed to go. So I have a variable called where to. And where to is room two and up. Those are my options for room one. So that's what I can do. That's all I can do. And I say if direct, which is the direction, is not in where to, then I'm going to say it's invalid. Or I'm going to print that I am changing rooms. In this case, I'm changing rooms to room two. And I'm going to return my new room. So my current room now becomes room two. I just changed rooms. So for room two, I can go down and I can go right. So let's just do one more round for this. So I'm going to input, and this time I'm going to input right. And... Right is in directions. My current room is still room two. So I'm now in room two. Um, I'm going to now see if I can move from room one from room two to someplace else. So I'm going to the options that I have, my where to is now I can go down to room one or right to room three. So the direction is in where to, so I'm going to change rooms, and now I'm in room three. Okay? So what happens if room three doesn't have up? So let's do up. So I'm going to type up. So I'm not in... Uh, my directions is in my valid directions. I'm in room three, so I'm not in room one. I'm not in room two. I'm in room three. So now I'm going to give it a try. And sorry, I stepped over. I shouldn't have stepped over. 
I'm still in room three. Let's do that again. I apologize. It said invalid input for room three, but let's go check as to why. So I'm going to do um, up again. I'm going to step over until I get to room three. Now I'm going to step into room three and hit the right button. I'm in room three and my direction is up. So where do I have an option of going? So I'm going to figure out from rooms of the current room that I'm in, I can go to room two by going left. So I can't go up. So I'm now, directions is not in where to, it's not in the keys. So I'm going to say invalid input and I'm returning the current room that I'm in. I haven't changed rooms. I'm still in room three. That's what's important. If you enter a bad direction, you have to stay in the same room. And then, of course, the one thing I always test for is whether or not I can easily exit the loop. Q. If it's Q, I break, and I'm done. And I'll figure out why for direct indirections, it's this for loop. I don't know what I did. I don't know what I did. I'll figure it out. And then I'll change it. Um, so this is what your game is going to look like on a very small scale. You're going to want to make sure that you name your functions appropriately. Um, and you're going to want to make sure that you reflect your rooms and what you can do. And for those who want to try, there's actually a, a slicker way to do this using the, just the dictionary. But, um, but I'll leave that to you guys. So I know we went through this really fast this week because there was a lot to go through. Does anybody have any questions? I'm opening up the mics. You guys can talk or ask questions as you want. Um, and if you're in my class, of course, if you are struggling with the game, don't struggle. Email me what you have. Email me the, the Python script, and I will take a look at it and give you hints. So anybody have any questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, I'm going to end it. I'll have this up tomorrow along with all of the scripts. You guys have a good have good luck and give you know on getting your games in. I know it's a big effort, but I am sure you guys can do it. So I will talk to everyone next week.